All right, here we are again, everybody. Early this week, right? Of a whole a whole day early this week. Uh, thank you for joining us again this Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I am Riley McShane, host of the Metal Blade Live series, singer for a Legion, and I am joined today by Sasha Dunnable of Intronaut and Dunnable Guitars. How's it going, man? Doing good, man. Just uh, just chilling. Oh yeah. So you're, you're saying before we went live, you're just like, dude, just having a quiet Tuesday afternoon. I'm like, man, it's the best, the best kind of Tuesday afternoon to have. Yeah, this is like my day where I am able to like come up to um, my, I have a little showroom store here in Echo Park that, and the store's closed on Tuesdays. So right. I get out of the shop and get to just get caught up on emails and do oh. Zoom calls. And... Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your, out of your, uh, decompression day to talk to us <laughs> oh, this is very decompressing already. Yeah. <laughs> so uh you know for those of you who can't tell uh pretty much right off the bat uh you know you're kind of known in the business as just being like super solid guy you know fucking a very positive outlook generally on things um you know wh- how how do you think that that has kind of gotten you to to where you are you know why do you think that positive outlook is is better than other options and you know maybe how do you think that's affected your musical output well first of all i'm a very negative person i'm just very good at hiding it yeah (laughs) Um, no i don't know i mean i just feel like in especially in music and whatnot it's like a lot of things just aren't worth um not being cool about so i think that's kind of just been um pretty easy to do and i don't know yeah i mean it's cool i i feel like uh it's fun to just be involved in like the music world so um i enjoy like making friends with people and you know i've kind of been involved in this kind of you know heavy metal punk you know whatever kind of universe for basically my whole life i guess since i I was uh old enough to make a decision to do that you know um so I don't know. It's just it's just fun. It's just what I enjoy doing. I just like hanging out with people and and being cool and you know, I guess I guess that's that's what that is, yeah. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Never really thought too much about it, you know. Just, just out here vibing, man. That's you know, it's the way to be. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just, you know, you see a lot of uh you see a lot of the opposite, man. You see a lot of people kind of treat it like it's a like it's a contest or it's like, you know, a a, a comparison game of like, you know, who can get to the you know, proverbial finish line faster, even though there is, you know, no, no real such thing as a finish line on success, but there's, right. you know, there's some people who like, you see a lot of that competitiveness and that, you know, instead of just like being chill, it's always this kind of like, you know, who's on top type of thing. I feel like that's less present in metal than other sectors of the music industry, but you know, it's a, uh, it's definitely, definitely a thing that, that comes up, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it just comes down to a person, you know, to that specific personality. But yeah, like you said, in metal and whatnot, I mean, there's really, I would think, very limited expectations as far as like what you're getting out of it in terms of like, I I don't know, like, just in terms of like the finish line, you're saying like, yeah. um, <laughs> never really saw much beyond, you know, um, beyond that as far as like what can be what you can be a dick what's worth being a dick about yeah. i guess and it's just kind of fun for me touring and meeting other people in bands like you and just uh you know people who work at the labels and people who work just at clubs and i don't know i just like being involved and um that's really where the fun is for me and and, and making the music obviously you yeah. know no one no one in my band at least we've never you know really expected any kind of like uh you know financial like windfall from this or um and you know if you've been i mean you play in like an extreme prog metal band like you know it's not like about the the chicks or 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 fame or money or anything you know so i mean if your intentions are you know revolving around something or your expectations revolve around something besides um just doing the thing you know, you're probably not going to last very long. Yeah, definitely setting setting yourself up for disappointment. You know, logging <laughs> logging into that 
Spotify for artists looking at your demographic by area oh. being like, why is it 98% men that listen to this band? I don't understand, dude. I got in this for y'all. Yeah. Like, where are my yeah. groupies at? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, you picked the wrong line of work. Yeah. Well, so, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm sure this outlook has a little bit to do with your background. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, your guys' music, uh, Intronaut, that is, is very... It's very powerful music, you know. I mean, that's always what has made me gravitate towards your band, uh, you know. In, you know, in, in that particular vein of metal, is that it's just like it. There's so much movement, you know what I mean? Like it's it's such a, a powerful force. Um, you know, what was, what kind of cultivated that? You know what I mean? Like, what was the scene like? You know that you grew up in. You know, it was the first music you remember as a kid. All that, all those, all those cliche questions that kind of led you to where you are now. In terms of like musical taste and influence and stuff. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I kind of grew up just. Uh, I uh, I guess you know popular music when I was like nine, ten years old was. Uh, I mean that was like around the time the Black Album came out. Um, you know, Guns and Roses you know some was somewhere in between appetite and the illusion albums um so it was like that era of you know heavy hard rock kind of being like on the radio and mtv um and then that kind of evolved into just getting into like kind of more punk stuff which at that point it was all about just finding you know the next extreme thing especially through those like high school years and whatnot so you're going from like black flag and then you discover like napalm death and then it's like mayhem you know and then once you can't go any faster than than that stuff then it's like all about the more like technical stuff and um that's you know me and a bunch of the guys i grew up with you know half of or probably most of intronaut is in that same group of friends um you know we started getting into like 70s prog like uh King Crimson and yes. By the way, I heard your band's cover of Roundabout. Yeah. I met your bass player in Denver, I guess oh, it was, rad. and he played it for me. And it, yeah, it was just it was really awesome. Hell yeah, um, man! Thank you. But, yeah, um, but yeah, like those records, like I kind of discovered that stuff around like the age of like eighteen, and that's when I was kind of like taking guitar playing or band playing stuff a little more seriously, you know, so getting into that stuff around the same time as like neurosis and stuff, just really, and you know, smoking a ton of weed at the time and whatnot you I, I don't know, I just liked I discovered that I liked sort of the headier side of like heavy music, and um that was sort of like the that's probably like the era that kind of like cemented my um like writing style and and all that um and then you know going to shows at the time it was like it, here in southern california there was bands like um you know that were like kind of like diy and and like sort of punk you know kind of but like heavy and like progressive like there was like um this band dystopia and oh, i love um, them like, I just remember seeing that in, like, some, sh you know, terrible little DIY, like, you know, room, like, you know, shitbox somewhere. And it's just, like, the most mind-blowing thing I've ever seen in my oh, life, yeah. you know. And um, so that was kind of, like, the real, like, that was the sort of the switch turning on. And then, you know, finding more extreme stuff from there. And, um, you know, we started Intronaut when we were, like, in our early 20s. So, you know, that's... I don't know that that was really it and that early 2000s late 90s like kind of like i feel like relapse or hydra had had a lot of bands that were kind of like doing you know heavy music but in a new kind of interesting way and right um yeah that was kind of that was sort of the the evolution of that and, and other guys in the band were uh into like jazz i mean I'm, I'm not a huge jazz guy but i can appreciate it and i certainly appreciate like the the theory aspect and um yeah. you know being able to just kind of like apply like just more harmonic depth to your music i mean i think i pull that a little bit from sort of jazz sort of um kind of on the on the peripheral sort of sense i guess but yeah for um, sure Anyway, and now at this point, it's like I'm 40. It's like I've listened to everything, and now it's all kind of just <laughs> around and 
in in my head like i don't really know where things are necessarily coming from when i'm like writing a riff at this point you know? yeah for sure i i you know i'm i'm a little younger at 33 but i experienced that same kind of thing man when i'm like I'll, I'll listen to something and oftentimes it's like i'll find myself getting inspired by all kinds of different genres of music and i'm like so i'm, I'm just so glad that i'm not the guy in charge of like the you know greater musical direction of my band because we would make no fucking sense if i was we'd just be this like horrible amalgamation of like well what if we did like like city pop from like the 70s 80s japan disco movement like what if we did some of that in this tech death record uh so yeah. you know because yeah. because i'll hear stuff like that and just be like oh my god this is so cool like it's so like and it just like drives my creative force uh you know totally from that direction but totally. yeah man i i want to talk about uh dystopia for a second like you know you were like yeah i saw them in this like real like shitbox like diy kind of situation and i'm like man i would kill i've never seen i've never seen dystopia uh and uh you know human garbage or human equals garbage or whatever whatever you want to call that record is like classic like it's it's so yeah. good um, still like really just dude, so good. It, yeah. it's just it's timeless and like to have a timeless grindcore record is like kind of a feat right like and so <laughs> you know i'm like you know i would i would kill to see them in that kind of place because it's like could you imagine seeing dystopia in like that house of blues like <laughs> no you, and like that's so thing. weird I, and they like wouldn't have done it too which was kind of like this other thing about that band that at the time where i was like that's cool like they yeah. won't play real venues yeah. like <laughs> only play places with no real pa like that's kind of awesome uh, yeah. and i feel like they I don't know. Yeah, they certainly could have. I mean, I remember like the last few shows they played, it was like, you're just playing a really big shit box now. And, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, the, the band probably could have like uh, sold out a house of blues yeah. probably in like the early 2000s. But oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love those guys. Uh, I got, I got into... to play my old band actually. Sorry, just to. Oh, go ahead. We played a show, my band before Intronaut, got to play a show with them at Gilman Street in Berkeley, which is already Sick. like just a legendary, like yeah. just dirty punk venue. Um, love the place. Uh, but playing a dystopia show at Gilman Street in like, you know, 2000, 2001 is like, uh, I just remember it was like the most intimidating thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, big, you know, smelly crowd and oh yeah they're dude. so good you know you want to like play you know you feel like the worst band ever opening up for you know somebody like that oh so, yeah yeah i especially. mean they have that, that energy dude friggin dino was just a madman like just the, yeah. dr the drums that was the first time that i ever saw like videos right of like drums and vocals yeah. um and in, in metal anyway and it blew my mind i was just like whoa how do you even do that yeah so yeah, 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 two kick drums. I mean, like every drum is from like a different dr different drum yeah. set. <laughs> this it was the first time kit. I saw yeah, a guitar player had like a delay pedal, and I'm like, what the fuck, you know? Yeah. That's what I want. You yeah. know, sound clips and shit in between songs, and then yeah. you know, I don't know. yeah, shit for sure. Yeah, yeah. I could do. I could talk for talk about them forever. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, so the same 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 thing with the prog thing man i'm like you know obviously we're big we're big prog fans over in the allegiant camp but i i followed a very similar trajectory with a, uh, you know i was like oh yeah like super heavy music death metal you know black metal uh you know once i you know because when i was like 12 13 it was like you know early 2000s uh you know like 2001 2002 and so i i kind of you know was like coming off of the like new metal kind of kick like i was like oh sure. well, there's metallica but what's heavier than this oh system of a down that's can't get heavier than this and then i started getting introduced to like cradle of filth and opeth and shit and i was just like oh oh and then you know lo lo and behold suffocation released pierce from within 1995 and i was like what that is this crazy and yeah. so <laughs> yeah so but then I, I i you know i went back and looked at all those prog classics when i was like early college like 18 19 yeah started listening to tons of like you know the, the the standards right king crimson and yes and emerson lake and palmer and all that kind of stuff and then you know kind of started deep diving into like the the weirder shit like gong and you know all the all the zool stuff with like uh magma and you know getting yeah getting into all the the crazy the crazy person prog yeah uh, which uh you know i 
I wish there was more uh, of a presence of, you know what I mean? Like, eat, like to this day, because there's tons of it influencing, you know, metal and, and prog rock and stuff like that. But I feel like prog rock is more, you know, the the Stephen Wilsons and the Riversides and all that kind of stuff, which right. is right. still great. It's still really good, but it does it just doesn't have that element of like, wow, you are on so many mushrooms right now. Like it just yeah. doesn't. Like... <laughs> right. I want my like lid blown off. Like, yeah. There's a difference between yeah. It's like Dark Side of the Moon. I guess is a prog record. Yeah. You know, but like yes close to the edge or even like relayer there's just some shit where you're like <laughs> this is barely music oh um, dude you know but it's just so intense and like you just have to appreciate that and the, the thing i like about yes and especially close to the edge i feel like that's still my like just like my blueprint for like song prog songwriting or whatever yeah. it's like to take a 20 minute like to write a song that is 20 minutes long and like it's a still a, like a cohesive song with like a verse and you know or a couple of different kinds of verses and different choruses but this, there's a song structure there it yeah. just takes 20 minutes to do it and yeah. that's like that's what i love yeah. that's what i really like rather than yeah some of the other stuff is a little weak and then on the other side there's you know stuff that maybe was like a little bit too out there there's some like some crap uh, rock and whatnot where i'm like this yeah. is just a little jammy for me you know and well, even even yes had that like soundscapey album, right? Uh, Tales Tales from a Topographic Ocean or whatever. That's just like that album's crazy. That's that's yeah. definitely one of those albums where it's just like this is just like analog keyboard, just yeah. just paradise, right? Like it sounds like I went into a guitar center where all they sell is Moogs. Like, I... <laughs> right, right. They had to try it. They yeah. had to get the shot. Had to yeah. do it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one last note before I, I move on to actual uh, guest questions. Um, yeah. uh, we almost did uh, Heart of the Sunrise from oh. from Close to the Edge. Yeah, I know, yeah. dude. I like I I wanted to because so, I like, the way I pitched it to the band was I was like, dude, like like all the keyboard parts you could do on classical guitar and like there's so much there and like it'd be such a sick like prog epic and all this kind of stuff. But then it was like no one outside of like yes fans know that song well <laughs> i don't know that's a pretty dude i would love to do that song because yeah. there's that the opening is kind of crazy but then there's like the groovy part oh which yeah is fucking just mind-blowing and then like the way the mellotron creeps in on that song yeah. there's actually a scene in the movie is i think it's called buffalo 66 with vincent gallo and christina ricci um which is what the I think the first time i heard that song but yeah the mellotron and that i love the fucking mellotron i yeah anyway yeah. that maybe we could do a collab a yeah right. let's, and we'll, we'll do heart of the sunrise me, me and you we'll do heart of the sunrise to. into it yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first uh <laughs> all right well moving on clearly you know man of man of many tastes uh and you also outside of playing music you build musical instruments uh with dunnable guitars um how how did you get started doing that um i guess to like keep it i don't know i mean i guess obviously i've always been like fascinated with the electric guitar since i was like a little kid mm -hmm. um and um i think that you know it, it, throughout my teens and 20s um i was never able to really like afford nice guitars or have more than like one at a time and also once you start once i started touring um you know anytime there was like a technical issue with a guitar like it stops making sound in your like on tour <laughs> and like that's my only guitar you know it becomes like a real nightmare so i feel like i started um kind of like wanting to at least know how to like fix or just at least know how these things worked um so that i didn't have to pay somebody to fix them and then i started i feel like around that time hanging out with a few guys who did like guitar repair or guitar teching um and kind of just learning some stuff from there and uh you know it kind of like as i was sort of bouncing between shitty jobs in between tours and um and living in LA, which is like a really expensive city, kind of like noticing that I needed to like 
get some actual like skill set under my belt um you know so that i could like earn a living when uh when i'm clearly not doing that by playing weird heavy metal um <laughs> or like you know just working shitty jobs that i hate so uh yeah i started like hanging out with some of these guys and learning all that and um uh a buddy of mine ended up uh becoming um he was a guitar tech for a bunch of years and he ended up becoming slash's guitar tech which meant that like all of a sudden there was all this work that just kind of freed up and so he started giving me all these jobs that um that he couldn't take anymore um mostly like studio stuff and um I mean, that would kind of happen at the same time that I got a, a job uh, working a repair bench at a guitar center in the Valley here in L.A. And um, around that same time, I moved into a house that had a garage because I wanted to start like kind of tinkering around and maybe trying to build guitars um, or at least open up a, my own repair shop. And this was probably like 2011 or so um, when the, all this was happening. And so kind of just found myself in this world where I'm like teching for people, um, you know, bands, like uh, mostly studio stuff, uh, I guess, um, you know, like just getting thrown gigs from like Logan Nader or like Dino from Fear Factory. Linkin Park was a band that I would go and like set up guitars for. Nice. And during the whole time, like kind of just um, building up my woodworking and kind of getting my tools together in my garage and then in like I think 2012 uh Intronaut put out a record or at least we were recording the record and I was starting to like actually build some stuff and then we um we went out on tour like a few tours that year 2012-2013 and uh, we were using them and naturally every other band you're on tour with is like what's that thing you're playing and yeah. you're like oh I made this and it's like can you make me one too? And then it's <laughs> kind of like, you know, some of those bands, bands went on to like be playing in front of a lot of people. And then those people see, the, you know, them. And um, before I knew it, I was just getting hit up, you know, to build enough stuff here and there to uh, quit every other job I had. Um, and so, yeah, for a few years, I was just building out of my garage and, um, you know, guys like, Jeff from High on Fire hitting me up to build a bass. He was sort of like the first guy that asked me if I could build a bass guitar. Um, that obviously was huge. I mean, uh, the guys from Deaf Heaven uh, bought a couple guitars, and then you know that was when they were really just just really killing it. And yeah. um, it just got a lot of eyes on the guitars, I guess, and just kind of. I mean, all, all the while, I'm still, like, kind of learning as I go. So it's, yeah. like, these things that I'm making for these guys are, like, not perfect, too. So I'm kind of, like, it's sort of, like, I really had to, like, um, you know, grind and really, like, um, figure it out fast because, uh, you know, obviously I, I wanted it to, like, keep going. So, yeah, just, I don't know, the, the next, I guess, what, six, seven years until now has been just a, a complete blur of... Um, just honing those skills and the 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 business growing you know right. um but yeah it's weird it's like i really didn't like intend on starting a business it's it sort of just started itself and now where there's like seven of us seven or eight of us and um we got a shop down in southeast la and uh you know we're the guitars are sold in a bunch of stores around the country and the, the world i guess and we have our own little showroom that i'm sitting in right now and yeah man i don't know that's, here yeah that's here so cool today. man yeah that's, that's such a, a like blur. it's such a rad story though you know what i mean like you, you rarely hear you know the 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 a to z of of you know how a business like that comes to life you know a, a lot of the times on this uh particular series we talk about you know, industry stuff and like, you know, business perspective, whether it's from, you know, artists or, you know, PR people or marketing folks or engineers or whatever. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool to, you know, be able to take that like full scope look at a story like that. Um, you know, cause especially now over this past couple of years, when a lot of people had to 
quit their jobs or experienced layoffs or whatever. I know tons of people, myself included, that started businesses. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear that like condensed version of the story. You know, I'm sure there's so much more that goes into it and things that you learn along the way, but hearing that like kind of condensed, like I said, like A to Z version of it, it creates this cool, it's almost like hopeful, you know what I mean? Like it's almost this like, right. like, like, yeah. like, you know, like this is, this is how it started. This is where it's at now. You know, I'm still learning every day, but like we're doing well. And like, that is so rad to me, man. I love, I love hearing stuff like that. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So big, big congratulations on, on being able to do that and, you know, take, take your weird heavy metal and turn it into something, you know, that, that extends far beyond the reach of, of a normal, you know, just metal band that kind of thing so right totally it yeah it's it's crazy to me too but yeah it really does just feel like kind of an extension of like what you know i i guess have sort of just been involved in for forever you yeah. know so it just feels organic but also insane at yeah. the same time. <laughs> absolutely um well so you know speaking of weird heavy metal uh you know, well, I mean, I guess before that, real quick, obviously go follow Donald Book Tars, everybody. You know, if you're watching and you have not seen or played one, you know, they're in stores. If you're in the L.A. area, go stop by, say hi to this wonderful man right here and uh, play one of his guitars. Um, yeah. so, but, you know, speaking of playing guitars and weird heavy metal, uh, you guys released an album, you know, right before the world went to shit. Uh, Fluid Extensional Inversions uh, came out February of 2020. You know, you, you obviously didn't get to tour on that album, which, you know, for those of you watching, if you're unfamiliar with the usual process of releasing a record, you want to be out supporting it with shows when it comes out to, you know, keep keep momentum going and, you know, show everybody your music and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, well, we actually did get to tour. We did one tour. Did you? That, yeah, it's it went from February. It ended uh, March, like. 11th of oh, 2020 wow. which was like the day yeah before everything shut down right and i it was like this it was really kind of i mean it's weird looking back on it but i just remember like doing that tour and like a weekend you know it was still february and we're like oh there's this epidemic you know of this coronavirus or something right. you know and then it was like we were in like new york and it's like first confirmed case and then it was like a couple of days later like it's now a pandemic and i'm yeah. like the fuck is a pandemic yeah. <laughs> first time i ever heard that word and uh, then as we got closer you know to the end it was like are some of these shows gonna get shut that night i saw a bunch of people who were who had tours coming up and they're like we just canceled our yeah. european tour you know yeah. had something booked for april and you're like oh let's see you know yeah and yeah, by the time that like mid-march point uh, yeah, remember those days where it was like, oh, let's see, maybe this festival we have in India in May is gonna happen. It's gonna be a couple. It's gonna be a couple weeks of a lockdown. It's like, no, then, yeah. What a yeah. fucking terrible thing. Talked about this and heard about this. Yeah, funny, but well, it's but anyway, we did get to do one tour, and yes, that album came out and um, right before then, I guess. So um, it's a bummer to not tour on it, like and do all the cool shows that we had planned for like the record you know we're 